Hello, Tech Pros, episode 95. You know, decide for yourself whether or not it's useful for you. Welcome to the podcast where I chat with professionals who are getting the job done using technology seven days a week. Each week, we start with Motivation Monday. Tuesday is about productivity. Wednesday, leadership. Thursday, technology. Friday, people in communication. Saturday, entrepreneurship. And Sunday, being unplugged. All right. Let's get started. Hello, Tech Pros. This is Chad Bostic, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Aaron Schlesinger. Happy Thursday, Aaron. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Uh, I'm I'm trying. <laughs> I'm laughing here because I practiced for like what, Aaron? About 152 minutes trying to get the pronunciation of your last name right. And uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's a work in progress. You know, yeah. like I was saying, like I was saying before we started recording, I was born in Texas and raised in Oklahoma. So there's a there's always a little bit of redneck that peeks out every now and then. So audience, bear with me. Aaron, bear with me. I uh, there's no telling what I may mispronounce. People's names, uh, programming languages, you know, all kinds of good stuff. But uh, it's all part of the learning and uh, experimentation process here on yeah. Hello Tech Pros. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people struggle with the name, so you're not alone, Chad. Cool. Aaron Schlesing, Schles, <laughs> help me one more time. Aaron Schlesinger. Aaron Schlesinger there is a go. software engineer at Engine Yard, where he's a core contributor to the Deus project. Being a Go developer for the past two plus years, he has distilled his knowledge of the language into the Go in Five Minutes screencast, which can be found at goinfiveminutes.com, as well as speaking at various conferences and events about Go. So, Aaron, um, we had an episode just prior to this, just about uh, 40 episodes or so away, back on episode 54 when I, when I talked to Bill Kennedy. And that one was a, a People Friday episode. We talked about how, you know, tech interviews are scaring away brilliant people, and he sees all the time, you know, that, um, I don't know, just uh, that sometimes we're really, really hard on our tech interviews, and there's some amazing people that maybe don't know all the answers to all the tests that you're going to give them um but they're really amazing people that need we need to hire so anyway in that episode you know bill is a go programmer and and he just barely mentioned i mean we had maybe two or three minutes worth of go conversation in there but afterwards twitter and and linkedin everything just blew up about it so i personally don't have any experience prior to talking to Bill with a Go program, programming language, but it seems to be either really, really hot or just the community is really, really um, like developed and supportive of each other and the language. Yeah. Um, so I think the community is is by far, um, it's at least in the top three uh, communities that I've seen, uh, just not just in the programming language communities, but of any tech community. Um, so if you talk about uh, programming languages or frameworks or uh, just in general like new technologies, uh, this is one of the most supportive and knowledgeable communities. Um, and I really think that comes from its roots. And the roots of Go come from obviously Google. Um, and if you don't know, Google created this programming language originally to solve their own problems um, inside of Google. But then it grew very quickly to com- contributors and community members outside of Google. Um, and sort of the spirit of Go comes from the practicality of a programming language. Um, and I can get into more, you know, why Go was created and all that. Um, but first and foremost, this is a very supportive community. Uh, if you go, if you're just starting a Go and you go into uh, one of the forums or they even have a Slack group uh, Slack is an instant messenger kind of mm-hmm. product. Um, and if you ask you know, any question from the most beginner or something you might think is dumb all the way to something super advanced that you know, talks about some low-level Go implementation detail, really no matter what you ask, this is going to be, uh, your question is going to be something that's well-received and directed or redirected to the right person to answer your question. And you're never going to feel dumb or... Um, you know, on the outside looking in. Uh, mm. and, and that's, to me, regardless of how well the technology has matured or um, what it's used for or how many people are using it, 
the community and, and especially that aspect of inclusiveness in the community is the number one most important thing. That is awesome. I can't tell you how many different languages or different tech stacks I've tried to learn over the years. And uh, there's a few of them, not many, but but maybe a bell curve where you got Go on the right-hand side that's awesome and everybody that's in it is love it and, and is just very supportive. And then in the big middle of the bell curve, it's just kind of, you know, just kind of average. But then on the left side, the horrible side where you ask any question, they're like, oh my God, noob, seriously? Like, go read the manual. Yep. <laughs> I did read the manual. I don't understand the manual. The manual doesn't make any sense. Like help help a brother out here. Yep. Yeah. I've been in those communities too. And and you know, it only takes one of those and, and you're out. You just don't want to be a part of that. To you're trying to get a job done and part of your job then has to become dealing with someone who's mean to you or or mean to somebody else and it kind of poisons the well. Mm, yep. Absolutely. So speaking of uh, have a job to do, so let's talk about you're a senior software engineer at Engine Yard and you work on the Deus project. So uh, what is the Deus project and uh, what does Engine Yard do and how do you contribute to it? Yeah, so um, the Deus project, uh, in short, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, the Deus project is a platform as a service built uh, as an open source project. Um, and what that means in a little bit more detail is the Deus project is a set of software components that run on top of Kubernetes. Um, and Kubernetes is a big platform that you run on a bunch of machines, and Kubernetes is kind of the, the fabric that connects all, all of those machines together and helps you run your apps uh, in a distributed fashion across all those machines. And so Deus provides a higher level platform that lets you package up your apps into containers and, and specifically into Docker containers. And then it uh, distributes them, puts them onto Kubernetes, um, sets them up so that if it's a web app, for example, uh, you can go to your domain and it will route that traffic to your domain onto the right containers. Um, and it just deals with some more of the uh, administrative issues like configuring the apps and setting up SSL certificates and so on and so forth. Awesome. So is this project um, live and available where people can get to it and you're just adding new features? Or is this something that's brand new that hasn't been released yet? Yep, it's live and released. And we just launched our um, official, uh, actually it's the V2 release because the V1 release was not on Kubernetes so it's a little confusing. The Deus workflow is the name of the product that runs on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and we're calling it the V2 release, but really it's the V1 release of Deus workflow. Um, so apologies for that confusion. But we just launched the official stable release of Deus workflow, which again is the Kubernetes release. And it's completely open source. Um, so if you can go to github.com slash Deus, or you can go to deus.com, D-E-I-S dot com, uh, and you can read all about it. There's a link on deus.com to go to the GitHub repo, or I guess the GitHub organization. Um, and each piece that comprises this whole platform uh, is, of course, open source completely in the GitHub repos. Um, and it's been our goal from day one to make those components both usable as part of the bigger platform that deals with all those concerns that I mentioned before. Um, but you can also use them as you see fit, sort of on their own. So... Um, one quick example is I, I had mentioned that routing platform, um, and that deals with all the SSL stuff, and it deals with uh, taking some traffic for a domain and routing it to the right containers, and there's a bunch of other stuff it does. Um, and we have a lot of people that just use that, that routing platform on its own, and they don't deal with, uh, they don't include or deal with all the other features besides the routing that the whole Deus workflow platform offers. Gotcha. And uh, speaking of, of communities who support each other uh just topically from what i've seen the kubernetes uh you know all the users of kubernetes really kind of band together and help each other out because that's a it's kind of a beast right yeah um you know kubernetes is a really ambitious project and again it was started by google um and it was started in response to a lot of google's internal needs uh, and kubernetes specifically was modeled after google's massive internal uh, cluster management software. Uh, it's, they called it internally, they called it Borg. 
Um, <laughs> and, and Kubernetes is not sort of a lift from the code base that they had internally, but it's written from scratch, modeled after a lot of the primitives that they had internally. Um, and yes, it, it is a beast. Um, there is a there's quite a few moving parts, um, and you know they all talk to each other in very specific ways. Um, but the Kubernetes community has done a really, really good job of making it very installable and very maintainable on tons of different platforms. Um, so internally, even we use Kubernetes uh, for development in sort of uh, let's see, maybe four or five different ways. So, for example, some people run Kubernetes on a couple of virtual machines on their local laptop. Um, personally, I prefer to run it uh, on Google Cloud. Uh, other people use AWS to run it. Um, and we've even had some of our customers run it on just bare metal machines that are in their garage. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it's, of course, it varies in difficulty to set Kubernetes up on different machines and different types of deployments. Um, but the docs are wonderful. The install methods are wonderful, f especially for clouds. Um, and most importantly to me, the community is really um, is really comprised of tons of resources. Uh, there's people from Red Hat. There's people from the CoreOS company. There's still a lot of people from Google. Um, and the community is growing. So all of those people are very focused on one specific piece. And one of those pieces, of course, is the deployment story. Uh, and the development is just blazing fast. So I, I'm really, really, uh, I'm really hopeful and I'm anticipating tons of growth even over the next couple of months. Awesome. Very exciting. Well, you know, Aaron, here on Hello Tech Pros on our Thursday technology episodes, it's all about the past, the present, and the future of technology. And you kind of hinted a little bit about the past of the Go programming language as well as Kubernetes, how they both originated from Google and they were solving some of the problems or the uh, the original products were solving some of the, the problems that, that the Google internal team was having and the reason why they needed this programming language, the reason why they needed this cluster management platform. So maybe you could help us dive a little bit more into the details of that and then maybe um, your your personal experience with these languages as, as well and kind of get us up to speed on uh, the past of, of these technologies. Sure. Yeah, so uh, Go, and you can actually read a little bit more about Go's past and its motivations uh, on golang.org, G-O-L-A-N-G.org. Um, but I'll distill it down here. Uh, so the sort of the, the colloquial story is that the creators of Go were essentially waiting for a build at Google. Um, so Google has uh, tons and tons of C++ code, and some of their builds take over an hour. So the creators were, they sent some code onto Google's big, huge cloud um, to be built onto their build servers. And while they were waiting, they kind of imagined this programming language and this tool chain uh, for the programming language that would build things faster, that would be simple enough for uh, sort of a new programmer that was just out of college to pick up, um, and would just be more pleasant to use. Um, and you know, as they were imagining this, they sent in their second build and their third build and their fourth build and so on. And it kind of started this chain reaction of thoughts in their head. Um, and of course, you know, when you have time to think, you have time to, um, to narrow down your problem space and become a lot more specific as to what you're solving and really flesh out more and more details. Uh, and as they did that, Go kind of grew in their minds, and eventually they began starting to implement this programming language. Um, and so the major things I kind of hinted at just now, um, it's simplicity. Um, it's a really heavy focus on native concurrency. Um, and one of my favorite parts about Go that was there from the start is this concept or, of orthogonality. Um, and I know that's a big word, uh, the word orthogonal in math, it, it essentially boils down to parallel. Um, so these are things, in specifically in Go, these are pieces of the language that don't interfere with each other, but they can be used together. Um, so one example is uh, this concept of interfaces. So in Go, um, 
interfaces closely resemble interfaces in Java, for example, mm -hmm. or um, a little bit less closely but still similar are uh, abstract classes in C++. So these are just constructs in Go that define what functions a thing should have. Um, but the really cool part is any type in Go can adhere to the interface. So you can literally have an int. Um, and if you define an interface, that int can adhere to the interface. And uh, you know, I've, I've written tons of examples online. Uh, you can find tons of other examples on other people's websites. Um, but you can use two interfaces together at any time. And if you have a type that doesn't implement the interface, you can just add a couple functions on that type and, and you've implemented the interface. You don't have to type, you know, this thing extends some other interface. It just auto automatically and immediately implements the interface. Uh, and, and that's a really good example of orthogonality. You, you really don't have to be concerned with defining what the thing implements. You can just go implement it and then use it and be done with it. Um, and, and so that's also a really good um, good example of the simplicity of Go as well. So anyway, get, getting off that tangent, um, that whole orthogonality thing is a really, really important piece of Go. And so that combined with the native concurrency features of Go really keeps the simplicity while also making Go super, super powerful. And then if you add in the tool chain, which I had mentioned before, um, the tool chain is super powerful and it always has been. Um, and it allows you with one single command, which is conveniently called the go command, <laughs> you, know, you can go into the terminal and type go build on a million line code base or a massive code base. Um, and it will build pretty quickly. Um, you know, I've done it on a 300,000 line, uh, line of code code base. So that's lines of real code, not just comments. Um, and it built in under five minutes on my MacBook. Wow. Uh, so it was a four core old school, well, older school MacBook. <laughs> we all know how fast tech moves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a four core MacBook with four gigabytes of RAM, which, you know, by today's most modern MacBook standards is not the best. Um, and that 300,000 line code base built in about five minutes. Uh, you know, it didn't use all the memory, it didn't spin the CPU up to 150% usage. It just chugged along and built the code base. And if you were to compare that with building a 300,000 line Java code base or 300,000 line C++ code base, that is a really good experience. And the creators of Go kind of initiated or started this culture of keeping compile times fast and efficient. And that culture has permeated all the way up to now across, oh, let's see, probably 10 plus major releases and uh, and it, it will continue to permeate because it's one of the most important things about Go. So, Aaron, um, you know, in the past when when Go didn't exist and Google only had the tools that everybody had at the time, you know, the programming language and the, and the build scripts that everybody had, and they started, you know, thinking about, well, we need something better and we need something different. And so they came up with these. Well, now in the enterprise or in startups, we have a ton of options. We have all of of you know kind of classic uh, programming languages when you think C++ or you think of Java uh, even you know .NET or or um, some of the other languages out there um, and then we have Go so when does it make sense to use Go and when should we look at some of the other languages like is there like a best practice a best fit for Go or is it kind of ubiquitous you can use it kind of anywhere for anything yeah that's a great question um, so Go was originally designed as a systems programming language. Um, so, you know, from, from that perspective, if you look at Go, uh, it really does systems programming well. So uh, we can look at Kubernetes as a great example. And Kubernetes deals with things like allocating resources for the number of CPU cores you have or for the amount of RAM you have. Um, and it deals with things like... Um, calling into the Docker daemon to make sure that an individual process is sandboxed so it doesn't use up all the RAM on the machine. And those kinds of things are really systems oriented. Um, and Go is a really great choice if you have to do low level tasks like that. But it also 
has been adopted by um, by developers of things like databases, and that's because it does concurrency really, really well. But you can also even go up the stack, and you can see that Go has a, a bunch of really well designed web frameworks. So if you if you really want to stick with Go all the way up the stack, you can build a web app with Go. Uh, you, you know, you're not going to find the all the features of something like Ruby on Rails. Mm. Um, but if you want to, it's it's not that hard to build a web application with Go, and that's actually something I've done quite a few times in my career. Um, so if you're looking in an enterprise for sort of the the best way to start with Go, I would certainly say start with a greenfield implementation, something new that you have to build, um, whether it's a systems like a server that deals with low level systems things. Or even like a command line interface. Go is really good at, at building command line interfaces. Um, and write it in Go. And I think you'll find that writing this thing in Go will not only shorten your, your time to completion, um, it'll make it, but it'll also make it really easy to learn. Um, and you'll also end up with this binary that's statically compiled that you can distribute to anybody. And you can cross-compile it to Windows, to all the architectures of Linux, to Mac OS X, even to things like ARM processors or FreeBSD. And you can just literally email someone this binary and they can use it out of the box, no dependencies. They don't have to gem install something if they're on Ruby or uh, make sure they have some shared library if it's a C++ binary. Um, you can literally just give them the binary and it'll work. So. I would say the start would be you know, a systems utility, a systems server, or a CLI. Um, and, and if you're in an enterprise, generally those kinds of things are relatively easy to find um, and oftentimes relatively easy to automate. And that's where Go would really shine. Gotcha. So this isn't a case where we want to say, okay, I am a full stack Go developer and I can build anything and everything on Go um, from the top front end interfaces with, with all the, all my favorite, uh, CSS and JavaScript libraries all the way down to managing the builds. Um, you might be able to do that, but it sounds like we really want to target fit for purpose, um, with a Go language, just like we do for everything else and kind of start with that bottom up approach of, okay, what are those command line interfaces, those system commands, those uh, back-end kind of plumbing things that we have to do, uh, the dirty work, the grunt work that, that's not sexy, that doesn't get a lot of like, uh, you know, I don't know, bells and whistles in the in the press and all that kind of stuff. But the, the systems plumbing that, that really drives the enterprise and makes everything connect together, that's where we want to start in that greenfield situation. And uh, when we have the chance, start with Go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Go hasn't taken over the world. and You're not going to find a Ruby on Rails that in Go that has all the features. Um, you know, it hasn't taken over the world yet. I, I really <laughs> hope it does one day. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if you find a utility that's low level and like you said, unsexy, um, Go will make it sexier for sure. Awesome. <laughs> um, uh, there are some stories, including from inside Google, where they rewrote a big C++ server in Go and cut it and I think made it like one eighth of the size or something like that. And, and you can go and Google it and find that story. Um, but in my experience, you know, something from scratch is the best way to learn Go and kind of build your first app in Go. So yeah. Awesome. Well, Aaron, we've talked about the past and the history of uh, how Go got started and, and where uh, when you first started learning Go, and then we've been talking very briefly about the present and all the things that you can build with it and where you want to start. In just a moment, I want to ask you questions about the future of Go and the future uh, maybe of, of what you're doing with Go. But first, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors. This episode of Hello Tech Pros is sponsored by Burdeen. Siri and OK Google are fun for party tricks, but 97% of smartphone users don't like talking to their phones in public. It's kinda weird. When was the last time you were at the mall and heard someone say, Siri, what's my wife's dress size? Or, OK Google, where did I park my car? Some things are better left unspoken. Berdine remembers the things you care about and reminds you discreetly through text messages. 
Names, dates, places, ideas, to-do lists, Burdine never forgets and is always there to remind you. You don't need to install an app, just text Burdine a statement and she'll remember. Text her a question and she'll answer. Burdine is the only contact you have to have on your phone. Meet Burdine at burdine.com. That's B-U-R-D-E-N-E dot com. Or text Burdine to 480-418-1411. Outside the U.S., be sure to use the country code PLUS1. So for non-U.S. residents, text PLUS1-480-418-1411. With a message, Berdeen. Okay, we're back with Aaron Schlesinger. We've been talking to Aaron, Aaron about the Go programming language, um, how it, it has its roots in, uh, well, the foundation was Google, right? Google found a problem in their own process and their own technology, and they said, you know what? We need something that's a little bit more simple where anybody can use it. We need something that's uh, more performant so these builds don't take hours. They take minutes. Yep. And uh, and we need something that can be, uh, you know, work in parallel and, and work, uh, you know, interface with just about anything out there. And so they built this Go programming language. And now, you know, in today's world, we talked about how, um, it's a really, really good choice for those unsexy situations where you're working on the, the the plumbing type of code, the command line interfaces, that kind of stuff that doesn't have those those slick UIs on it. Uh, so yep. Go is a great fit for those things. So Aaron, let's talk about the future for just a moment. So we can talk about both the future of the Go program, programming language as well as your future plans and what you uh, what you have in mind for it. Yeah, so starting with the future of Go, um, I think that Go is going to grow in its usage of those, as you said, those unsexy and kind of low-level systems uh, projects and tasks. And you can kind of already see that. Um, you know, if you look at Docker, which you might have read about, uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's exploding in the press, and uh, it's this whole containerization solution. And a lot of people are saying containerization is the new virtual machine. Um, and I, I think just about every CTO out there is saying, how does this matter for me? Should we be doing it? Should we use containers? Why should we use containers? So on and so forth. Um, but what some people might not know is the Docker project is almost all Go. Um, if you look at github.com slash Docker, D-O-C-K-E-R, mm-hmm. you can see tons and tons of Go code. Uh, the whole Docker daemon is written in Go. The Docker CLI is written in Go. Uh, they've got a ton of distributed systems work they're starting to do, and that's all in Go. And you can jump over to the Kubernetes project, which is what I talked about before. Um, that's one of the technologies that we're building on top of. That's 100% Go as well, or maybe not 100%. Uh, it's, it's at least 90% Go. <laughs> um, I know they have some front-end stuff in there that's going to be JavaScript. Um, and you can jump all around the ecosystem of systems software and things that are solving system problems and go is the choice um i know there's another database uh, for time series data called influx db that's written in go a lot of monitoring software is written in go these days so you can see a lot of the new products things like kubernetes cluster management new databases um, there's another database that's built sort of in the model of google's latest and most fault tolerant database Another open source product called Cockroach DB. That's 100% Go uh, for the data layer, um, and so you can see, you know, a lot of the old software is still the old system software, at least, is still your C++ code bases or your C or Java code bases, and you know those things probably won't change, but the new stuff and the stuff that they build on top of those old older code bases in Java or C++, that stuff is starting to be Go. And it's not like the people on the Go team are out buying Google ads or, you know, promoting Go for your next big enterprise product and you know, charging for support of, for Go or anything like that. Uh, Go is almost entirely an open source product. Um, and in fact, the Go standard library and compiler and runtime is 100% open source. And it's just happening that Go is the best the best choice for these systems problems 
And it's starting to be a really good choice for websites uh, in sort of front-end web apps. And there's even some, some pro uh, projects out there for open source that are starting to use Go for mobile apps as well. Um, there's, another, there's another project called Gopher.js that's literally a compiler that can change your Go code into JavaScript. Um, so we're seeing some real projects like Kubernetes, as I mentioned, that are 100% Go. And, and we're even starting to see some experimental stuff out there that's pushing the boundaries and trying to get Go into other places, uh, into mobile apps or into front-end web development. Um, so both of those kind of initiatives are happening organically. Um, and they're both very, very promising. And they're even showing off the, this growth of Go. Um, and in my opinion, I would say in the next two to three years, Go is going to become the de facto standard for everything cloud-based. Um, you know, if in two years, let's say it's going to be in 2018, that would be two years from now, um, July 2018, it's going to be the case, and this is my prediction, it's going to be the case that if you start a cloud technology or you start a web, uh, a web app or even a startup that does something in the cloud, the question is not going to be, why are you doing this in Go, or what's Go, or are you sure Go is the right choice for you? The question is going to be, if you don't write it in Go, why are you not writing it in Go? What's your reasoning for not writing it in Go? Um, and that, to me, is very powerful. That's going to be indicative of Go being the de facto standard for cloud applications. Um, and I'm not alone in this opinion. There are other prominent people in the cloud ecosystem and in, in the Go ecosystem as well um, that have this opinion as well. Well, I think a, a big part of that, um, that acceptance in the enterprise comes with the community support, right? So uh, regardless of how performant a, a technology is, regardless of how easy it is to use, um, if the if the uh, community is not screaming for it, then it's going to be really, really hard for uh, for architects or executives or or those decision makers to really buy into it and say, yeah, dude, this is uh, this is where our future lies, right? Because they want to make sure that uh, you know if if they implement something that they're going to be able to sustain it for the next five years, ten years, whatever it is, and that there's going to be a great community of developers to hire or to uh, you know outsource or or however they're going to do to to support the tools that they're building now, you know, someday in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that point about hiring for Go is huge. Um, hiring for Go, and in fact, let me back up a second. Go, as I kind of brushed on before, Go was designed at Google to be really easy for people to pick up. Um, and that spirit lives on. You know, Go looks a lot like C, or more like C++. You know, it has things that look like object-oriented programming. So if you come from a C++, a Java, a Python, a Ruby, uh, even a JavaScript background, you're going to be able to learn Go probably to a reasonably proficient level in a weekend. Hmm. And the resources are there. They're, they're free. Um, most of them are even on golang.org. Uh, there, there's even one thing called the Tour of Go which you can write Go to learn Go in your browser. You don't even have to download any of the tool chain. Um, and, and these are the things, again, you touched on it, these are the things in the community that make Go so approachable. And then just the design of the language itself um, makes Go very easy to pick up. Um, and, you know, I decided to go and, and start this Go in 5 Minutes screencast to get people from that level of, proficiency up to kind of the expert level in Go. And I did that because I don't really see a need for too many more um, beginner's guide to Go or, um, or you know, resources that help people get from nothing to writing Go. And I, I decided not to do that. And I think that um, you know, new, new beginner's guide books for Go are not as necessary because People already know Go. They just don't know it yet. You know, they, know how, they know pretty much what the syntax is, and they know pretty much what you know, uh, you know, log.printf does because log.printf looks a whole lot like uh, you know, printf in PHP or you know, the print function in Python or whatever. Now, that's not to say that 
you know, if we see a new beginner's guide to go book out there, that it's useless because I'm almost certain that it won't be. Um, but you know, just me personally, I thought that it would be more uh, more effective and more useful in the community to build and write that kind of teaching material to go from the beginner or intermediate level up to the advanced level for Go. Um, you know, and that's what I try to do with Go in five minutes. No, I think that's awesome. I think that's a um, you know really valuable thing that you did is take a look at the market. Um, take a look at the kind of education process that that uh, a a new Go developer has to go through in order to get up to speed on the language, get up to speed on the tool sets. And like you said, if they are already comfortable with some of the other technologies, some of the other programming languages, like they have a foundation in computer science, they have a foundation in a, in a, a different programming language, then transitioning over to Go may be extremely easy. And uh, there, it's not like they have to learn a lot. It's just kind of shifting a little bit of the syntax left and right, right? But it, yep. making it to that next level, like okay, now I'm a I'm a Go beginner, I'm a Go noob, and I know how to I know how to build some things, right? Hello worlds are easy now. Check done that. Okay, sample projects check done that. Now I need to really make sure that I'm using the industry best practices. Um, that I'm doing things the right way that are performant, that are scalable, that are supportable, that, that other people are going to look at and go, yeah, that's the right way to do it and not just hack together. And so that's what you put together in your go in five minutes screencast and you're teaching people how to, how to implement those best practices. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and those best practices are also in the tool chain too. And it's not, it's not just the code. Um, so again, if you start out with Go, you download the Go tool chain, which is an installer uh, on Mac and on Windows. You run an installer, and when it's done, you have Go. And you can type Go build, and that's it. Your program will be compiled for your platform, and you can run it just like any other executable. But once you get more advanced, you start to deal with things like dependency management and versioning, uh, cross-compiling, and all sorts of things like that. And again, that's, that's sort of where this advanced level education comes in um, because when you have to deal with, for example, dependency management, that's where you're going to be working most likely with a much larger product or project if you're in the open source world uh, and where you're going to have to know a lot of the nuts and bolts about how Go did or did not do things with dependency management and what are the industry best practices today for it and where is the industry going with respect to, in this case, dependency management? Um, and so, you know, it, it's not just the code, although I try to focus very heavily on the code. Um, it's not just the code. It's sort of just like in any programming language or technology ecosystem, it's the things that surround the code as well. And, and I try to touch on those as much as possible in the time that I have. Um, to make sure that people who write Go at least know what they're getting into and they know what if they keep writing Go and they keep you know, building bigger and bigger projects. They know what's in store for them and how to approach these problems as they hit them. So Aaron, we talked about the future of Go and how, in your opinion, Go is, is uh, just on the verge of taking over the world and making <laughs> everyone's projects just a little bit more sexy. But tell us about the future of, of your screencast stuff here. Now, um, do you have plans of, of it changing or staying the same? What are you going to do with it? Sure, yeah. Um, so I have both. Um, I want to keep going five minutes as is, for sure. Uh, I want to keep having these five-minute screencasts out on YouTube. Um, you know, I'm going to keep the goin5minutes.com website up. Um, and I'm also, this is part of the changes, uh, I'm also going to start launching some paid screencasts. And they're not going to be five minutes. They're going to be more like 15 or 20 minutes. And they're, to start, they're just going to be extensions of what you can learn in the five-minute public screencast. Uh, so, for example, um, I just launched a screencast, oh, in I think the beginning of May, maybe the middle of May 2016, uh, and it was about Go's capacity to talk to SQL databases. Um, and I got a ton of feedback asking for more about connecting to MySQL and more about how you, do, uh, how you can build database models and kind of organize your code in such a way that you don't have to care as much about the mechanics of building a SQL query. Um, and I realized that 
that kind of thing would be best covered in like a 30 minute screencast or maybe even a 45 minute screencast. Mm -hmm. um, and so those kinds of things, you know, the extensions on the existing topics I'm going to cover in the free things, those kinds of things are going to become paid screencasts. And they're going to be available on the same exact website, um, even on the same exact page for the free ones. Um, you know, it's going to have just another link that says get the extension. Um, and I don't, I haven't really decided on a price or anything like that, but my goal is to make them pretty low, pretty affordable. Um, but I just want to be able to get paid for my time because as it stands, a five minute screencast takes five to six hours right now to really produce that quality that I want. So a 30 to 40 minute screencast is going to take significantly longer than that. Um, but then in addition, I have two other plans. One is, uh, I'm writing a book. And the book is going to be uh, in, the, in a pretty similar spirit as Go in 5 Minutes. So they're going to be, for each chapter in the book, there's going to be a really easily digestible uh, principle of Go or best practice for Go. Or one thing I've been focusing on lately for these chapters is um, a pattern, a Go programming pattern for Go. Mm -hmm. um, and these are going to be things, again, that are sort of on the more advanced side. They're going to be patterns for doing like dependency management, as I mentioned. Um, I've been focusing a lot on concurrency patterns lately, uh, and those are things like con uh, concurrent barriers or producer consumer or publish subscribe kinds of patterns. Um, and and then also there are going to be things about uh, future adoption topics or future projects uh, that are coming out for Go or that are getting big for Go. Um, and again, I'm, I'm focusing on these chapters being really short and easily digestible. Um, and, you know, that book is a work in progress. And I've been throwing around some ideas with launching one chapter at a time for the book. Um, so that's kind of an unknown so far as to how I'm going to launch it or if I'm just going to wait till the very end, till the book is completely done and then launch it. Um, but I'm looking at somewhere for the book, somewhere around October or uh, September, October 2016 kind of time frame for that. Um, but this whole longer, uh, more extended paid screencast idea is probably going to be by the end of July 2016 is when you'll start seeing those screencasts. Awesome. And uh, that time will be on us before we know it. And speaking yep. of time, we're, we're running out of time. So before we go, <laughs> Aaron, could you share some parting words of wisdom for our audience, the best way that we can connect with you? And then we'll say goodbye. Sure. Uh, so parting words of wisdom, check out Go. That's really it. You know, decide for yourself whether or not it's useful for you. But at very least, check it out because Go is coming to take over the world. Um, also check out goin5minutes.com uh, everything is free on there right now uh, not just the screencast but all the code that you see on the screencast is available there's a link to it uh, on the website uh, even the outlines for the screencasts are available too uh, that's goin5 the number 5 minutes.com I'm sure it'll be in the show notes as well and then the best way to connect with me um, the really on the website, all the contact information is there. There's Twitter. There's an email address, um, which is also my personal email address. So don't spam me, uh, <laughs> please. Uh, there's a there's a GitHub link as well to my personal GitHub repo. So any of those methods is is fine. Um, I just encourage you if you have questions about the contact there or questions about what I've said today. Uh, I really encourage you to just tweet me or email me or carrier pigeon me or whatever is the best way for you. <laughs> um, you know, I answer questions about screencasts every single day, so I'm more than happy to answer yours. Awesome. And you can find the links to all of that here on the show notes on today's episode. This is hellotechpros.com slash 95. This is episode 95. So if you go to hellotechpros.com slash 95, you'll get access to all of the topics that we've been talking about today, including uh, the resources that Aaron's been mentioning, as well as uh, links to how to get in contact with him. Aaron, thank you so much for joining me on Hello Tech Pros today. I really value your insight and appreciate you taking time out of your busy Thursday to spend time with us. Sure. Thanks again, Chad. You this bet. Was fun. And uh, Tech Pros, keep your eyes open. Go's going to take over the world. <laughs> You've been listening to Aaron Schlesinger, and I'm Chad Bostic. And until next time, take care.
The show notes page for this episode can be found at hellotechpros.com slash nine five. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review, subscribe to this channel, and check back tomorrow. This has been Technology Thursday, but tomorrow my featured guest and I discuss people and communication. On Saturday, we talk entrepreneurship, Sunday, being unplugged, Monday, motivation, Tuesday, productivity, Wednesday, leadership, and back again on Thursday to discuss technology once again. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.